Hi, everyone. Happy Saturday. Uh, I'm Melissa Gismondi, and I'm here live with Jessica Weisberg, author of April's Book Story Selection, which I have a copy with me right here. Uh, asking for a friend, three centuries of life, love, money, and other burning questions from a nation obsessed. Jessica's writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Guardian, among many other publications. And she's also been nominated for an Emmy for her work on Vice News Tonight. So Jessica, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. So I want to start off by asking you, you know, kind of where the idea for this book came from. You've done a lot of different things. And I think, you know, Backstory is a podcast. A lot of people in the podcast world might know one of the podcasts you worked on. So you helped produce Serial. Um, and now you wrote this book about the history of advice. So why did you want to turn your attention to that subject? Sure. So the um, the book actually preceded Serial in a way. Um, what happened was I was working um, I was working at the New Yorker. I was um, doing a lot of things there, but one of the things I was doing is I was writing the sort of anonymous book reviews in the back of the book. And the way that works is that there's uh, books are sort of coming in and you tell the editor what books you want to review. And a book was coming in by Cheryl Strayed, Tiny Beautiful Things, which is a collection of her advice columns from the website The Rumpus. And I was like, oh, I like to review that one. I really liked those advice columns. I really liked her novel. And the editor was just sort of like, no, we're not going to review an advice book. Like, what are you talking about? And I thought that was interesting. Like, I just was like, there's, there's a lot going on in that decision. Because this is a, and this is an editor I have a ton of respect for, I should say. Um, you know, it's like, because this was a book that was that was like going to become a bestseller. Cheryl Strayed was a very sort of respected novelist at the time. Um, and so it was like, well, why does entering the genre sort of gain you so much power, but sort of lose you some respect? And what's going on there? And I wrote an article for the New Yorker's website, sort of about advice columnists and women and why this role had sort of fallen to women historically over the years. Um, and then I moved on to different subjects and serial and other things. Um, but it's sort of the idea stayed with me. And I had written other sort of stories sort of related to the subject. And I wanted to go back to it. Um, and I felt like the subject matter took on new relevance and new importance after Donald Trump was elected president. Because Obviously, like we think about the soft power advice columnists have, that he was an example of it really converting into hard political power. Mm. Say a bit more about that, because I think that might not, I mean, that's an interesting perspective of linking uh, advice, the history of advice columns to Donald Trump's election. What do you mean exactly by that? How it kind of took on new, uh, it was more prevalent or something like that, it sounds like for you. Well, I think he's a person, well, I think the, the, the political era sort of made this book feel like it had higher stakes for a couple of reasons. The first is that you know um, the, our our president you know came to fame largely because of an advice book, like that was how he was became known. That was how he got his TV show, and his fame sort of was generated by being a business expert. Um, and um, so that was interesting. And then I also think that one of the things that the political era changed for me was I think that um, I am one of those people who doesn't like to be told what to do and doesn't like the idea that there's like, um, that people should censor themselves, certainly. That, would, that really doesn't appeal to me. But there's something about the political era where you hear people in very public positions and powerful positions saying very bigoted things and very sexist things. And I think that gave me more um, kinship with some of the people I was writing about in the book who really wanted to enforce some social standards. And I think I saw the value and the purpose of what they were doing in a totally different light under this administration. Hmm. So, well, let's get into the book a little bit. And so, you know, I know some people have been able to read it already. Some maybe not so, are, are still trying to get a copy of it. But you kind of break it up into, there's four different sections and then there's 16 different stories throughout that you tell to kind of chronicle this history of advice. Whose story, and, and there's lots of great ones in there, but whose story 
kind of stuck with you the most that you kept thinking about that you're constantly like really fascinated by this person and their story? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, well, definitely more than one. Um, let's see, if I had to choose one, um, wait, I think part of it's Dorothy Dix, I think would probably be the one that really stuck with me the most. Um, she was an advice columnist at the turn of the 20th century and just became so widely read. Um, one of the, the details that I found out that I sort of loved is that there were sociologists um, in, like named the Linz who did this sort of um, this sort of lo this longitudinal study of the values and patterns of behavior of people in the Midwest, and they found that the single most influential um, way of getting people to change their opinion in all of America was this woman Dorothy Dix's advice column. Um, she was incredibly influential in her time, and it was a, that was a time when not that many women had public platforms, and certainly not public platforms of that scope. And I think what sort of interested me about her was um, there's just a lot of interesting turns in her story, um, including the fact that you know she was um, she came to writing life and this and advice giving like much later in life. Mm -hmm. um, and what was also interesting to me was just her her um, feminism, because what was interesting is on the, um, she was a suffragist and she knew Susan B. Anthony and all those women, but her advice column, she was, she she did a very different thing than just sort of advocate for women's rights. She just like let women complain. She just really encouraged women to sort of say what was wrong with what their situation was. And her advice wasn't always to change it. Her advice wasn't always to like leave the terrible husband or like, you know, like, like get mad at the terrible boss. It was just this space for women to sort of vent. And I found that's really interesting that this was like, that this was a need that like really precedes the internet. And um, <laughs> that, and that like, this was sort of a kind of feminism too, for women to be able to tell their stories and sort of say that their problems are problems. Um, and that being sort of a first step to any change. I found her very interesting. The first chapter done, John Dunton, I think is really fun. And um, he's a really good character. And I just think, um, you know, so he, as you know, he, like he started an advice column with his two brothers-in-laws and this guy, they like were sort of thought might be a doctor. And they were thought, then they pretended they were like 24 people and had all the questions anyone could answer. Um, and people just wrote to these guys with like their most vulnerable questions and I think um and John Dunton was a character and the questions from the 1690s are fascinating and what's sort of fascinating about it is just how similar they are in a way to the questions we ask today like there's never been a time in life when it's not hard to tell if someone likes you back <laughs> you know that's like just really stressful for people in the 1690s than it is today and I felt like that was that really stuck with me the fact that like um that even if the kind of advice you receive chains, a lot of the questions are staying the same and the sort of vulnerability and like what allows that vulnerability to stay the same, like um, being anonymous really allows people to share things they wouldn't share elsewhere. So there's a lot of what you said that I would want to pick up on. And one of the things was I did want to talk about Dorothy Dix because what struck me with her is how, and I don't know, you know this is my sense is, the importance too of being a powerful, influential ad advice giver, a person who gives advice is also you have to be a really compelling writer. Like you have to convey that empathy and some of her lines, I just was scribbling them down to have them to remember them. Yeah, she's a great writer. And she was obviously advice, she was best known for being an advice columnist, but she was also a very well-known theater critic and a crime writer. She's a great writer and clearly a great reporter. Um, yeah, she wrote very short, very pithy, very determined sentences, and they're, they're very, very memorable. So do you think that kind of speaks to how we're, um, that even advice books, we don't like, and like you said with your editor sometimes, we just kind of segment them off as they're not in the realm of other kinds of writing, but 
you have to be so skillful to be able to speak to the person that you're trying, whoever's trying to get the advice, you have to speak to them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, like, I think what's really interesting is that this is a genre of literature, whether we treat it as literature or not, that really a lot of people respond to and that um, have had has had a huge amount of influence on people's lives over centuries. And yeah, it requires a skill set and it requires a unique skill set. Um, like a part of it, of course, is, um, you know, part of it, of course, is just like being someone who people are willing to be vulnerable with. And that is a writing skill that can't be taught exactly. There's just something I think a lot of them had, including Dorothy Dix, that just made people want to seek her opinion, made people want to tell her things. And it's just some sort of ineffable quality in some people's writing and in just in some people's personality. So, and, and I think kind of speaking to that is, and you lay this out in the book, that this is kind of feeding into what I think is really exciting new history of the history of emotions, mm -hmm. emotional history. Alongside, you kind of point out that being able to trace the history of cultural wars in America from a different angle. So yeah. I wonder if you could speak to how the two of those intertwine. Sure. So, I mean, I found like there's a lot of advice givers throughout history sort of enter into culture wars. Um, there was one that I write about very early in the book about this sort of culture war that was sort of in introduced by this British statesman named Lord Chesterfield about what was more valuable, being honest or being polite. And he thought that the most important thing was to be polite. He thought that you should never say what you feel. You should always just sort of keep your guard up and imitate others and never show the slightest hint of emotion. And it really, really hurt, like annoyed people. And there was real debates about it in America at that time. And, you know, John and Abigail Adams really hated this guy. Like it really like got to people. And, you know, and that was, it was just because the advice has been a place where people are sort of moderating and determining norms. And a lot of what culture wars are about are norms. Like what is normal? What can, is acceptable? Like are the college kids protesting today just being college kids or are they snowflakes? Like what is normal is really what culture wars are about. Like sort of determining the parameters around norm normality and the advice givers sort of gave themselves that role to sort of decide what's normal and what's right. And so obviously they invite a lot of, um, a lot of criticism and a lot of controversy because deciding what's normal is a very like, powerful thing to do. Um, and then of course, with emotional history, like saying what's normal sort of can often ignore how people are feeling. Like that's why norms are hard and why like the idea of norms are, are sort of something you wanna, it doesn't make you feel good to, have to, like, to think about norms sometimes because they ignore people's emotions and ignore people's individuality. So to me, they're, they're very linked. Um, because as soon as you're saying like, no, the way, the normal way to be is to not say what you think. You're just telling all these people who want to say what they think or feel like the situation that they're in doesn't represent who they are, that they need to suppress their emotions. Um, and so I think you see that tension a lot between like the history of, of norms and the history of emotions. Or even, uh, um, as you were kind of saying there too, and with, the people seeking out advice it's it's even if it's anonymous it's very vulnerable right mm -hmm. and so not only the power of being able i don't kind of macro sense of being able to say on some platform of this is what is normal but then also on this individual level of people trying to seek out some sort of um satisfaction of do i is are these feelings normal it's it's very personal right Absolutely. And people just ask, they just really trust advice givers with their like really most vulnerable questions. And I think what's really interesting about advice columns as sort of technology is that before the internet, like when you didn't want to know if there were other people out there who felt the same way you did, advice columns were like a really good place to go. Um, to be like, is it normal that 
like I like to dress in women's clothes and I'm a man. And you see a lot of letters like that. Um, and so and like that's where people are sort of reconciling how they're feeling with what with what the norms they're experiencing are and sort of trying to trying to reach out to the norms outside of their small communities. So one other person too I really wanted to talk about is and it maybe you can um just kind of tell those who haven't read the book yet a little bit about her, but Mildred Newman, I think, is a really interesting example of trying, I mean, really successfully towing the line between objectivity and subjectivity in her um, in her advice and which and her uh, relationships with the people who are seeking her advice. Yeah, absolutely. So Mildred Newman was a therapist in New York City. Um, and she really just became known in the 70s as the therapist for, for famous people. It's like she was Nora Ephron's therapist, as, as well as many other actors and directors. And, um, and what she did is she sort of was a very untraditional therapist. If you needed her, she was there. She like invited her clients to her home over the weekend. She like had really close personal relationships. And I think in the process of doing that, she realized that her clients really seek something that wasn't just traditional therapy. They were seeking this encouragement and affection and, um, you know, just like a, a really good friend. And so she wrote this self-help book that called How to Be Your Own Best Friend, which is like, as a lot of people say, is like the first, like sort of example of like the modern self-help as we've come to define it. And it's really just a like a it's it's a book that's just a lot of sort of encouraging one-liners about sort of trusting yourself and letting yourself do what you want and self-care and you know just treating yourself as kindly as you would treat others. Um, and so, and she just became, you know, and that kind of advice is clearly really popular today. Um, and I would say like that's the, uh, the majority of sort of advice we see today is sort of more in the self-help category than in sort of the more of, than in, I would say the advice category, which is sort of more get like more geared towards thinking about others as opposed to thinking about yourself. Um, so she really created that. And for me, like she um, really recognized that like what people wanted was this very as you said like subjective thing they wanted they didn't want concrete advice as much as they wanted just to be told that that we're doing is fine and to be told that they were great and that they just needed that in their lives and that that was like a very human need as opposed to be like the way to succeed in business is to always wear blue which is like the kind of advice that I think some that you see more sort of in the era in like the decades leading up to her. And you mentioned to the internet, which I think is so, I mean, as you said, there's so much about self care on the internet right now and mm -hmm. so many um, blogs about it. And we, it kind of segues into a question actually that one of our listeners submitted. And this is from Julie and Julie says, I was intrigued by Benjamin Franklin in the early part of the book and his use of different characters or personas to get his messages out. Does the internet and its ability to make a person anonymous give modern advice columnists a similar platform? Oh, I love that question. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think that I can, I think what the, I think it, all the advice columnists in the book in some way had a persona. And Benjamin Franklin was interesting because he had many. Um, you know, that's why people write under pen names. And that's why, and some of the pen names are, you know, very elaborate personalities, like Miss Manners, I write about later in the book, which is like a whole character, not just a name. Um, and so I think that the internet, do, just because there's like a, it, there's a shrouded nature of the internet, does give people the ability to sort of create new personalities or new facets or personas more easily than, um, yeah, more easily than, you know, it was before. And certainly there's opportunities to create more personas um, for the most industrious advice givers among us. Julie also had a great question about um, advice columns in teen magazines. Oh, 
And if you had any thoughts on those, and I thought that that was also such a great question because it really speaks to, I think, the importance of age in, in all of this, of how old someone, at, at what stage in their life people are looking for advice and how that shapes the kind of advice that they're looking for and maybe what um, what sort of advice they want or if they want an empathetic person or more kind of direct. Did you have any thoughts on that, kind of the teen magazines and age? Yeah, well, I think that um, my memory of teen magazine advice givers was that they were very, very blunt. They were just like, he doesn't like you, break up with him now. And like, I write briefly about Dan Savage in the book, and I think he does that, certainly. It's just like, the right thing to do is this. Um, and I think like with teens, there's a certain, um, I think that advice givers have a certain tendency to be a little bit um, more blunt for whatever reason. Um, maybe it's because they think the teens will do what they want, whether they say whether regardless of what they say, so they might as well just say what they think. Um, but yeah, in my memory of reading, reading teen columns is that they were always very direct. Um, and like most of the advice givers in the book are direct, um, but not to the same extent as those for teens. Um, and then in terms of empathy, um, I think mostly people have always sought empathy. And I think for teenagers, um, I don't have, like, I think like someone who says, I'm sorry that's happening to you, that happened to me when I was a kid, um, is really important with teenagers. But I think it's really important for all adults at any age. It seems to be one of the hallmarks of some of the most successful advice givers that they were able to convey that empathy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another kind of key aspect, I think, of the book um, is the extent to which, and this gets into a lot of big themes in American history, but the extent to which the drive for self-improvement and advice and all of those things from, you know, Benjamin Franklin, or as you show even before, is uniquely American. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you can speak a little bit to that and if you um you know where you think that comes from why you think that's the case yeah i think i i write in the book that the obsession with unique advice is a uniquely american thing and that's very much true like there there are certainly advice givers in other countries but regularly do they reach the sort of same level of prominence as say like oprah does here um like we have a special place in our Part in our society for advice givers. Um, and yeah, I think that it reflects a lot about American society that we think that their answers are out there and that was just like a little bit of guidance in the right direction that anything is possible. It just shows that the American dream really looms large in people's imaginations. Um, so I think it reflects something very um, optimistic about American culture, that this is something that people are really striving for. I also think like from a historical point of view, um, it really shows that like when you look at the advice givers I write about early on in the book, like just how, just how like ever, like America was really interested in being like a different society. That like they were injured, like all these people were writing books about etiquette and how people should behave and how people should treat others. Cause there was this window of thinking about all these things in a new way. And a lot of people took advantage of that. And Benjamin Franklin, you know, wrote those books and maxims cause he wanted to influence American society. And that sort of openness to like what norms should be is something that I also think is uniquely American. That, like that norms can change and that people can dictate them and that they have more you know volatility and room for growth than they might in other societies and i also think it reflects the fact that you know we don't have a state religion it's like another factor so um, mm -hmm. that there are sort of secular people that people turn to for advice here more so than in other countries so that they're kind of holding the position that a spiritual leader might hold in other countries or cultures yeah or I see like in countries where there are is a state religion, it'd be harder for a secular person with all the answers to step in. Hmm. 
And do you think it, and one, and I know this is kind of a theme too in the book, it, it inevitably though, right, creates this tension where you can never be fully satisfied with yourself <laughs> in a culture where you can always improve yourself just a little bit more. I know. I mean, that's like, I mean, that's the cynical thing about advice. It's just like, and that's why it's such a good money maker. Because of course there's no like, there's no, and there's no, there's no saving people's need for it. Um, and I think that's why it's been such a successful industry in America as well. Um, there's always going to be a sequel. Like, you know, people can always seek new tips and new ideas about how to improve their lives and themselves. Does it, and my sense too, is it also kind of speaks to this um, value, I guess, really in American history and culture of individualism, that you as an individual can remake yourself, that it's, it's, um, it's less kind of understood to be the, the social kind of community perspective of building, well, building communities is important, but that emphasis on the individual that's been so strong. Yeah, I mean, one thing that interested me about looking at advice throughout time is that, not throughout time, throughout American history, um, is that um, you know, in the advice earlier on in the book is more community directed. It's more about how to make um, other people feel comfortable in a room. It's about how to be a good employee how to be a good wife, it is more sort of outer directed. And then over time, you see advice becoming very much about um, you know, self-satisfaction and self-actualization and all those things. Um, and I think that, um, so you see the sort of heightened ind individualism happening over time as you look at advice. Um, but even in the earlier era, when people were sort of thinking about um, advice as a way of sort of being a better wife or being a better worker, there's certainly like, an, it's certainly seen as like a means to an end. Um, and so you really see that it, even, even then it was sort of catering to the very like sort of individualized competitive society. And it seems like one of the biggest, well, and this is, I mean, kind of segueing to circle back as we start to wrap up and you, you mentioned Donald Trump of now there's someone who kind of made a name for himself giving advice on how to make money and now he's the president um that we're really turning to celebrities for advice <laughs> and that they've yeah. you mentioned oprah and she i mean she seems to be an interesting like maybe unique example but i loved you know when you talk about gwyneth paltrow as someone who was an actor and now is running a lifestyle company uh, website where do you think well when do you think that kind of starts and and why do you think that's become uh one of the dominant ways in which we're looking for advice now is to celebrities i think that it's i think it's a couple things i think that part of it is that um like there's been this push i think um for public figures to be more and more vulnerable for their audiences these days. Um, and giving advice and being open to advice sort of puts your vulnerability on a stage a little bit. I think more celebrities have been doing it because it's good, it's sort of good publicity and good self-branding in a way that it wasn't that long ago. Like you wouldn't have wanted to see Audrey Hepburn get ready for the Oscars. We just want to see her at the Oscars. But now we want to see all the actresses like pick out their dress and put on their makeup. Like there, it, there's something about wanting transparency that our current internet era sort of demands. And I think offering advice is a way of sort of offering a bit of transparency, but also putting uh, celebrities being in the position of offering advice rather than um, receiving it. So I think that's part of it. Like this, that sort of, um, this push towards vulnerability and transparency in our culture. And then I just think in terms of it's part of just, it, it's the fact that like, who doesn't, it, this is a bit of wishful thinking. These are people, people look up to and think are beautiful and smart and they're offering advice and that's very tempting. Um, you know, it's just an opportunity to relate to someone who seems otherwise unrelatable. And I think that's very exciting for people. Um, I think that there are different kinds of advice givers. Some 
who really try to be on the same level as the people they're giving advice to and some who are more aspirational figures. And you see over time, both of them being successful, but there's a long history of just very aspirational figures being very successful advice givers. So I think that sort of fits into this mold certainly. What's the the kind of the most striking continuity that you noticed from you know the 17th century to today in terms of advice? Um, I think it's the similarity in questions. Um, I think that was the most striking sim um, striking similarity, and just like how much love and sex has been consistently perplexing to people forever. Like any obviously novels have captured that, but there's something about it being captured by real people that's um that's very touching. Um and yeah, how much people are struggle with um yeah, and just how much people struggle with like their, their relationships with their families and um, you know, that you know, the olden days weren't as simple as we like to make them seem. Like they were just they were just as full as emotional turmoil as our current moment. And I do want to close, though, by asking you what the best bit of advice that you read while you were researching. Oh, that's a really good one. Um, let's see. Um, I mean, I think that um, this manners has, like, some very straightforward advice, which is just that, like, etiquette is just about treating other people the way you want to be treated which is i think for someone who like sort of balks at the idea of etiquette and it being sort of full of pomp and circumstance that was sort of like a nice thing to remember and then dorothy Dix had this line in something about just when someone was stressed out that the best thing to do is take a walk around the block i think that's probably really good advice <laughs> like there's kind of a magical way to walk around the block and do that is my that is what i took away from that part of the book it's hard to do in the moment sometimes when you know you should go for a walk, but well, if you can remember, it's pretty magical what it can do. Um, well, Jessica, thanks so much for making the time uh, to chat with us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. I really love this podcast, so this is fun. Great, thanks, and thank you to those of you who uh, might tune in later or who tuned in now, and we'll see you next time.